And I have to ask this because I do see a guitar, but I'm also watching at Agatha Harkness, and I see a witch's hat back there. So are you also a witch, uh, Sonic? <laughs> <laughs> my essentials my witches <laughs> my daughter's costume <laughs> well you wear you're wearing black oh and God. so it all kind the of poor effect with my witch's hat <laughs> oh my god i mean i didn't even think about my witch's hat in the background <laughs> just wondered if maybe you know you're like, okay, music supervision, too indie, witch, <laughs> witchcraft. <laughs> Couldn't hurt uh, as far as this business. I mean, I'm all for it. If, that, if it makes a difference, I will, I will certainly do I mean, that. Um, but it is my daughter's for... Halloween costume back there. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll go with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. Oh, shoot. Everybody knows I'm a witch now. <laughs> Don't you just love those shows that do something funky with their intro theme for holidays? Well, I do. Hey, welcome to Make Music Income. And for this episode airing on Halloween, we have some very scary sync licensing stories that may or may not have been told by a witch. Okay, so that's not exactly true. They aren't scary stories and they aren't told by a witch as far as I know. As I've told you many times about when I first heard about this thing called sync licensing. It was on a podcast. A lady named Kathy Heller was talking about how artists and songwriters and producers could make music income by getting their songs into TV and in film and into advertising and into video games. Hearing that podcast was basically a turn the car around, I will turn this car around moment for me professionally and just in my brain, it, it kind of changed my path, both professionally and my personal music focus as well. I went from being a music producer for artists to really a music composer again, back where I started, eventually getting my first sync deal with a BMG library and also a master's degree in music composition. Who would have thunk it? Well, I would have because it was kind of my dream since I was a teenager to get a degree in music composition. I just didn't think I could. Scary twist? <laughs> Not really. Well, today I am going to speak with Sonnet Simmons and she was part of the journey with Kathy Heller and their company Catch the Moon. And now she works in and teaches others about sync licensing and other things through her company to Indie. Today's podcast is sponsored as always by me. Get free stuff like the newly updated 50 Ways to Make Music Income or start one of our courses for free. You'll find information at makemusicincome.com slash free. Don't be scared. It's free. And now let's get to my interview with singer, songwriter, sync agent, and maybe other things, and co-founder of Two Indie Sonnet Simmons. I don't know if you remember, but we kind of intersected at Catch the Moon. Do you remember at yeah. all? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I thought it would be interesting to do like one minute of each of us t talking about, or a couple, a minute or two, about how we got to Catch the Moon. Because I look at that as, for a lot of people, I think, that was the life change time. You know, I, it was for me. It was for me. I was a full time, you know, music producer in Nashville. And we had just decided to move to Orlando to live our Disney dream, and uh, which we do now. And and just because we were ready for no more snow and ice in Nashville or Kentucky or wherever we were from. And yeah. <laughs> uh, I was literally driving to Nashville after we moved here, and I heard a podcast with Kathy Heller, who I call the great sync disruptor, um, because I feel like she disrupted so many people's – or helped change so many people's lives at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I, you know, I've been a songwriter since I was 13 and then kind of transitioned to a music producer through the years and then moved to Nashville and worked for uh, since then, basically there. When I heard that though, I was ready for a change out of music producing. And I knew that I wanted to kind of, when I heard that, you know, that I, I, I knew that licensing existed. I knew that I had started in music for commercials and music for TV and stuff like that at the studio I started at. But I got involved with artist work and then that just became my job. But um, that when I heard about sync and licensing and that it was a thing, I was like, why am I, why am I not doing this? And plus I had kind of wanted to get back to composing and writing, uh, which is how I started. But somehow you get off on other tangents in this business sometimes. And I had got off on another tangent of producing music for artists around the U.S. and the world. And that was my business. And that was cool. It was great. You know, you get to be in the studio in Nashville with great players and engineers all the time. But um, I just wasn't writing. It had been become more about the client and the artist than it had been about my own writing. And so this was part of my transition back. But that's how I... That podcast was my point. Mm. Where was your point? Wow. My point of getting connected to Catch the Moon? Well, I'm just talking about getting connected to licensing because uh, mm. that, to me, was the big change. Was um, not sync, to sync, but just licensing in general for music. Yeah. Well, I had performed the song Summertime for a live event, and it was on, it was on um, YouTube. YouTube and somebody was doing this big commercial campaign and they found me singing and they wanted to license the song Summertime and wanted me to sing a cover of it and found out they couldn't afford they couldn't afford Summertime yeah. um, and so they said do you have any other original do you have something else that we could you know present to the client and I ha was really new at songwriting I had just written a song called you're no good for me and I was like I had this one song like I'll record it and while I was recording it, I was like, well, like, why is your no good for me going to be good for a Coca-Cola spot? Like, I don't, I, maybe I should change it to you're so good for me. And I changed it to you're so good for me, me and the piano and my dog running around in the background and a little voice recorder sent it in. They loved it. They used it for this whole amusement park campaign uh, with a Coca-Cola campaign. It turned into this huge media blitz. Everybody wanted to know who was singing this song, like what's going on with the song. And I I had no idea like anything about licensing. It just kind of, you know, there it was, this miracle that happened for me. Um, and have any idea how to repeat it, any idea how to like take advantage of it. I just really was like deer in headlights yeah. about it was you know if, if something like that happened to me today i would be so ready to capitalize sure. on all of that yeah, being like right. let's go um and then fast forward a few years later kathy reached out to me and said hey i'm, I'm teaching this message i'm teaching this in-person class you should come i had just come off of a reality television show singing show um on abc i was feeling pretty heartbroken and decided i was giving up on music and she was like well you know, before you give up, why don't you come <laughs> to this class? Yeah. And um, I decided I decided to go and I, I showed up and I was like, wow, I just love everything that's coming out of her mouth. I love this woman. And she didn't have anybody on her team. She didn't know, you know, like she was w carrying the water that she was. I was like, oh, well, is anybody working for you? Like, can I work for you? Is there some way I can support you? And it ended up being that she lived down the street from me. <laughs> And I just showed up every morning. Starbucks was between our houses. I picked up Starbucks, came over. She was pregnant with her third child. Um, and so I would just come over. I didn't have any kids. I wasn't married yet. And could come over at 6 in the morning before her kids woke up. And we would just work on Catch the Moon and building her business. And um, then, you know, she started her podcast. And I really started running the licensing side of things. Yeah. And then when I had a baby, I took a break um, for about a year, and John came in and started teaching. Um, I remember that. And and that's that. Yeah. That's that's kind of how I got back into the world of it. Yeah, because so after that first big thing that happened, as um, that, of the song you wrote that got into theme parks and everything, why not continue with licensing after that? You just thought it was a one-off, or? Oh, because I was so naive. I mean, I did. I was like. <laughs> 
like I just want to be a famous singer that's going to tour. Yeah. You know, I was like, I'm not going to stop the train. I, I'm, I have a band. I'm going to keep doing my thing. I did have another amazing like overstock.com license asked me to write a song based on the other spot that I did. And yeah. I, they actually put me in the commercials singing the song. And still, like, it didn't hit. I was like, it didn't hit me yet. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know? I think like, I still didn't get it. it. It was a different time. I mean, we live in a totally different business a different now. Time. And the model was, yeah. I was still convincing artists to make a thousand CDs in 20. 17 16 and 17 you know i mean it was it was starting to be tougher but for that had been the the business model since i became a producer you made a thousand C actually when i became a producer you also made cassettes <laughs> yeah i had one lady who yeah. made cassettes until 2010 because she she was a jamaican singer and she would go back and forth to the islands and she could sell cassettes there but oh my gosh amazing. cds still you know, we're selling in the mid-teens. I don't think CDs, the yeah. death knell, actually came until COVID. Actually, I think the death knell for the independent artist kind of came with COVID um, in a lot of ways. I kind of became a producer exactly at the right time in 2000 because I think that from 2000 to 2020 was like the 20 years of the independent artist, I think. Mm. That was like the glory days is what I think. And it, because wow. you could, you could just find a producer, make – music well you couldn't do this in the 90s and you you may not have yeah, yeah. you know in the 90s you in la or nashville you couldn't even get the players or anything they were too busy they were getting triple scale and double scale and it, and it was they were printing the labels were printing money because of cds and then it happened the opposite way as cds as streaming came in it kind of went opposite they weren't printing money for a long time labels were very concerned in nashville until about 2015 when they realized streaming would probably rescue them. We've both talked about how we kind of were, what we were doing until that seminal moment when we met Kathy or we, we, we realized that licensing could be a thing and should probably be the thing. I mean, it, it almost at that point you realize it about licensing. And this is why a lot of people come to the, the channel that I do and they're like, I, they've never heard that people doing this before. Even stock music licensing, they've never heard of that before. And, they, and I know people who make thousands of dollars a month doing even that. But I'm talking about the people who are doing uh, sync type stuff. It's a shocking world once you get into it. It's like the curtain is revealed. And uh, it's actually been going on for 40 years, 50 years. I mean, this has all been around. It's just, it wasn't a, a hot button topic, but also we didn't live in the music industry. We did. We lived in the artist based become a star music industry, mm -hmm. right? So what has happened since your revelation of, of licensing? I started writing music that was more, I, I started understanding how to take the music I was writing and really make sure I was hitting some uh, markers that help for landing sinks and started meeting the right people and started having my music pitched and started landing some great ads and spots and really understanding about the industry, you know, who's who and, and where's my place in it and how can I be of service to one, I, uh, Catch the Moon closed a couple of years ago and Kathy gave her blessing to John and I to create our own whatever we wanted. And mm -hmm. um, we created a, a community-based membership for independent artists around the world, helping them really understand sync, but also connect them to opportunity every month. So yeah. it's a really inclusive, opportunity-focused, results-oriented community. And that has been great for me as an artist because I'm always bringing in new industry people. I'm always interfacing with them. I'm always sharing music. And I'm helping other independent artists in this field that feels like a really murky place. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I do is I, I do business development and pitching for catalogs. And so different people will bring me on to do that for their for their companies um, because of my experience in the ad space. And right now I... Um, I, yeah, so I, I recently started doing that for another company and have really enjoyed being back in the space of pitching and try to remember to keep writing, writing yeah. for me as an artist and, and as a creative outlet and writing for what works in, you know, in ads. And I'm a mom of two little toddler girls. So. That's, then it's that a takes a little life. time, you know. <laughs> it's a busy life. Yeah, and I just also try to, you know, give myself grace that 
it's not a race. We just keep doing what we do and, and try to enjoy the process. Yeah. I think for composers and songwriters who are also artists or not, this is possibly the best possible thing that you can do. It used to be yeah. when I came up as a, as a songwriter when I was a kid, when I was a teen, I wanted to, be a, I wanted to get a publishing deal. That was my lifelong goal. Yeah, I went. I didn't even know yeah. what that meant, probably, but I just knew I wanted to be paid for songwriting, yeah. you know. And uh, so I would go down to Nashville and I would take songs. That was the worst place. I lived in Kentucky and Lexington, so Nashville was only three hour drive, three and a half hour drive, and you gain an hour. But I probably would have been better off if I lived in like Nevada or something. I could have come to L.A. and pitch, because I I was doing jazz and pop and stuff, and Nashville is a country town and or a gospel. Uh, Christian town, you know, as far as the industries that live there mainly. And I just, I was just writing weird Alzaro type stuff or, you know, pop jazz and different things like that, which no one had an interest in, in Nashville in the eighties or nineties, especially. So when I found out about licensing uh, through here and Kathy, I just, that really began my transition back to being a full-time composer, which I am now. But I wasn't then. I was still producing. I do yeah. still have some production clients, and I am producing some sync clients now who were kind of co-writing together, but they need a producer, basically. And so I produce with them. I worked and worked with some of my Nashville folks on some great, great pop, very positive. The one thing I learned from, from Catch the Moon was, or one of the things I learned, was about positivity and, and how positive music is probably the best one of the best things to have as you're pitching. Mm -hmm. At least one of uh, it almost never fails to have a nice positive song that somebody can use for something. You're smiling at yeah, that. Yeah, it's a good mindset for life too. It really is. And plus I had a whole my producing career was mostly in the Christian music industry. So it was easy for me to kind of transition into more positive music yeah. since I'd come from yeah. that kind of thing. But I worked and worked and in, in, I think it was around 2020, I got my first kind of deal with a library, a BMG sub, uh, sub library or whatever you want to call it. And mm -hmm. then other libraries came and I did start to get into non-exclusive music and stock stuff, micro sync, if you're fancy. Um, and uh, <laughs> then I, I had I knew I wanted to go back to school. I had gone back to school in Nashville while I was producing and got finished up my bachelor's, and I wanted to get a master's. And I was going to do it, strangely enough, in music history. But I ended up changing that to composition, and I had a ball for wow. four years uh, wow. working on a master's awesome. in composition, which was totally foreign because I'm not a classically-based player. You know, I'm a songwriter. I'm Billy Joel and something like that. That's what I came up on. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't come up – doing classical music. And even though my mother was a piano teacher, I just wasn't interested in learning anyone else's way. I wanted to do my way. Like most musicians, you know, I want to be a, yeah. I didn't want to be yeah. a rock star, but I did want to write pop songs and I didn't need classical stuff for that. But mm -hmm. I am so glad I got to take orchestration and, you know, classical composing and, and just do things that were out of my wheelhouse, which is helpful now as I'm doing a lot of cues and things that depend on orchestral programming and uh, orchestration and so i am sp i'm messing with spiccato violas every day and and stuff like that you know which is so fun and so that's where yeah. i am now i'm with eight i work with six to eight libraries depending on how many um i just kind of start working with another one that's composing amazing. i have clients that i'm other are also collaborators and we're pitching stuff together and uh, i'm trying to do that's some work so cool. for higher stuff. So that's been my journey from CTM. And you've talked about your journey. Now, all that's done. I have some questions. Um, okay. <laughs> ready. The, these, are, these are things that I kind of sh showed you before that I want to talk about because I, I think these are the things I keep hearing different things about. Not that I'm like, sure. uh, I have like dying questions unless I know this, but I think everybody wants to, to know a lot of this stuff. And the first thing I want to talk about is exclusivity. Anything I go to where it's a, a listening session or, or anything like that, one of the same things I ask every music supervisor or sync agent or whoever that's there if I, if I ask a question is how do they feel about exclusivity? And almost every person thinks differently about it. I, I yeah. You know, I, there's so many conflicting views about it. I have 
sync agents that say it doesn't matter to the music supervisors and I have some music supervisors that say yeah it kind of matters and let's say you about exclusivity in your experience yeah it's interesting I mean everybody really does say something different and you have to just kind of go with uh what is best for you and if you're prolific you can have a couple different sort of deals and see what works I think um I have seen everybody was exclusive for a long time, you know, in the industry, and then it was everybody was non-exclusive. Everybody changed their deals. Everybody started going non-exclusive, and then I would say, you know, a number of years ago, everybody started button it up again and say, "Oh, we're all going exclusive. We need to re-sign this. We're going exclusive. We're going exclusive." Um, and now people are going non-exclusive again. So it's like <laughs> there is a wave also within an agency. They also are constantly changing their terms. You know, not every agency, but. Um, I think it's indicative of the industry, like exclusivity. Uh, some agencies feel like, you know, I can see both sides. Some agencies, they're pitching the music. They want to rep the music. And then if you, you go somewhere else and you can get it for less or you go somewhere else and then that person gets the license and you've been working so hard to get this name out there or maybe you only represent some of the music and then you're like ah you got to go over here for the rest and then you don't get the license but you are the one who brought it forward i get that and then also as the artist you know you tie something up with somebody and they're not fully like behind you pitching you all the time going to bat for you i mean if you're yeah. going to exclusively sign up my songs like i want to know you're really going to bat for me because nobody else is pitching those songs and do you have both the ad side world and the tv world are you you know are you doing games like are you pitching everything or are you more like we're just in the tv world and you're not getting pitched for ads and you're exclusive and so you know like really being informed on what kind of a deal are you signing and with what kind of an agency and what type of music are you signing so if you're signing your like ad friendly stuff and they only pitch to TV or you see that they really only have television placements, uh, I would I would weigh that out and consider that. So I think that's an important aspect just to consider. I personally have some music with exclusive libraries and then I have my non-exclusive buckets that I have with a few other um, agencies that are my non-exclusive agencies and just making you kind of diversifying depending on what it is and this is also why we put together a conference every every year called get repped although i think we're signing it to get signed um this year this coming 2025 where we bring in all these licensing agencies so that you can hear from them are yeah. they exclusive are they non-exclusive what are they why? thinking this Do they year take publishing <laughs> yeah exactly and i actually just talked to this new to another agency and they are uh, non-exclusive and they want to really break the mold because they're like hey we don't want to take somebody we don't want to wrap up somebody's music if we can't get them a placement yeah. and then you know certainly I think music supervisors they're only inconvenienced two things one though they get the song from two different places you know now they have to deal with that I don't think that that's happening all the time but you know it maybe it does maybe it happens I'm not getting all of those I'm not a music supervisor but if you're going non-exclusive, don't have two agencies that pitch to TV all yeah. the time rep the same songs. They're pitching for the same stuff. Like, mm -hmm. make sure you have like a TV agency and a t and a ads agency. Don't double up. And then the other thing I think that um, supervisors sometimes see is like this one artist is coming at me from every single light from every single agency. Yeah. They're spread so thin. Like, do they have? you know is this clearable is this okay do they know like what the business side of things it kind of gets a little bit murky so you also don't want to be the artist that's like everybody you know like you've got seven agencies non-exclusively repping you and this supervisor just always sees your stuff and they don't really know if it's legit or not to clear like who's going to be able to clear it would that be similar if you were in six to eight libraries like i am and they're all exclusive well one of them is not ex is non exclusive, but if they're all exclusive, and 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 different, they're finding different songs from me. Do they really go? Oh, is is that a problem? Being in too many exclusive libraries? So. Yeah, I don't think so either. No, I don't think so. I mean, especially because when you're working with an exclusive library, you know that's an exclusive library. You yeah. know that that music is you know not anywhere else. You're yeah. I, I I have to think, 
from the music supervisor's point of view, and I try to get people to think about this, their job, they are not financially motivated by anything having to do with your song, other than the fact that they got the right song for the right thing, right? I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but um, one thing I haven't had on this this channel that I would like to have, just really more for my own enjoyment. This whole channel is for my own enjoyment, Sonnet. Um, I get it, yeah. <laughs> I just... I just get on here and, and talk about what's happened to me. That's all I'm doing. I, there's no big secret here. But, um, and what's happening to me. But I, I, the, it seems like most supervi music supervisors are just like, I just need this song. I need this song right now. And um, the funniest way I ever heard it put was by Mark Freezer of uh, Sync Summit. Do you know Mark? And, yeah. uh, you know, he said, let me tell you how it's done. You know, Mark, he's like, let me tell you how it's done. Here's how it's done. Here's how it goes. Number one, they, they go to somebody they know for the thing they want. They have people they love, and they go there. That's where they go first to give them the money. And then somebody actually said this yesterday. A music supervisor said this yesterday. She wants to give money to the artist that she knows if, they, if she has a big thing. And she has people that she knows that do great. She wants to give money to to artists. And he says, after that, if they can't find that, they go to a, an agent that they know, an agency that they know has good artists, and they go there. And then at, at, at the end, they get to the point where we're, we're, we don't either have any money or any time. We've got to go to a library, and we go to, they'll go to their favorite exclusive libraries. What do you think of that? Do you think that's a pretty good, from your experience, how music supervisors think? In, in a lot of ways, like that, you're saying they first go to the artists that they know and love, and then they'll yeah. go to their sources. Agencies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think you go to your trusted sources first, whether that's a, a the go, the going to an actual artist directly. You know that artist has the type of music that you need. You know, the, uh, sort of thing. So yeah, if they're like, oh, I know this artist would have the perfect thing, or maybe they'll have something that's perfect. This is the sound I'm looking for. Um, or they go to yeah, the people that they know, like and trust. That's mm -hmm. why, you know, on the world of being business development, where I'm, or you know, on a licensing where you're pitching a catalog, you're pitching composers, you're always making those relationships so that you become a trusted source for people to send briefs to and to um, uh, you know create custom work for and so when you're like what's my agency doing they are creating they are pulling songs for briefs they're making sure they're top of mind they're making sure they're a trusted source for people they're who's working on what how can I support them um, you know along with all the other tasks of being depending on how many people are at the agency of course but there's a lot of hats to wear. Yeah. It does seem like libraries are the last resort in a lot of, a lot of ways sometimes, though. Oh, was that your question? Well, no. Yes. Just part I think of it depends it. on budget. Yeah. Just yeah. depends on budget. I mean, oh, I was talking to somebody in ads yesterday, and they're like, I mean, if it's a digital thing. You're just going to pull something for $500 and not worry from a library and not worry, like, do we have all the rights? Can we get the clearance on this? Blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. You just know it's pre-cleared. I can get it. Like, done. Stick it in. Let's go. It's up <laughs> for, go. like, a week. Yeah. You know, seven days. I don't need to have the headache of oh. clearance and all of that. So, yeah. So, as w with uh, this this work that you do sending um, catalogs out and stuff out to people does that kind of make you a sync agent do you think of yourself as that in that role um i mean i walk that line i guess uh i don't i don't uh i haven't been doing that regularly for the last number of years i just kind of got back into that role creating being in business development for uh a company and in that i've turned a little bit back into a sync agent Yes, yeah. <laughs> I guess so. You know, kind of just because that's the world I know. I know how to do it. And it and turns out that that's kind of part of the business development is also being a sync agent. And I have to ask this because I do see a guitar, but I'm also watching at Agatha Harkness, and I see a witch's hat back there. So are you also a witch, uh, Sonic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have all my essentials. My witch's <laughs> daughter's costume <laughs> well, you wear, you're wearing black oh and God. so it all kind of of course that's just my witch's hat <laughs> oh my god I mean I didn't even think about my witch's hat in the background 
always wondered if maybe, you know, you're like, okay, the music supervision, too indie, which, which craft? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't hurt uh, as far as this business. I mean, I'm all for it. If that if it makes a difference, I will. I will certainly do that. Um, but it is my for... daughter's Halloween costume back there. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll go with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. Oh shoot! Everybody knows I'm a witch now. <laughs> well, Sorry I am witchy, that. so <laughs> I have no um, trouble being a witch. I'm happy to be. Okay. All right. Um, let's stay along those lines and talk about um, libraries and versus direct. Now, this is a whole video I did with um, – I've done it with several people, but I did it with Tamara Bubble one time or a couple times. Every time she's on the show, she she yeah. is very much a believer in direct um, sync, you know, only. Only. Mm-hmm. Like libraries are for suckers only, you know. Mm-hmm. She really feels that way. And, uh, and and she's not afraid to say it, and I can I can say it because I've, we've actually talked about it on the show at least twice. You know, she's yeah. she's yeah, been yeah. on here talking about it. So, um, I uh, here's my feeling. I think I can do both. You know, I think I can easily do both. Uh, I probably can do libraries easier because I like to be in here with these things. You know, this is where I like to be in play. You you have to be a hustler. People who really will go out and you and people who will go to all these things or start things. I mean, I guess I hustle as well, but I think I like to hustle from the song point of view and you do too. You know what I'm saying though? Uh, hustle networking yeah, yeah. basically is what I'm talking about because yeah, you I get it. really I have get to it. and we're going to talk about networking in a minute. So, um I, I take it you do both those things. You've already kind of said you do. Yeah, uh, I do both of those things. I mean, I would say since COVID networking hustle is a little bit easier because everybody's online and everybody wants to be online and everybody's working from home yeah. and everybody moved out of major cities and you can do Zoom calls and you don't have to just be like, can I take you to lunch? Can I pass you in the coffee shop? Like those sort of things. So there's, there's some sort of... Um, more ability to connect with the people in some ways. Um, but that wasn't your question. Oh, libraries? Were you asking me about libraries? Libraries versus or? direct or libraries and direct. Okay, so yeah, I was looking for clarification because some libraries meaning not sync agencies or libraries meaning sync agencies. Sync libraries. Or di- and direct, okay. And direct or, or meaning directly like, to the supervisor? Yeah. Directly to the supervisor slash advertising client slash whoever's going to be paying, okay. you know. Right. And I think what Tamara Bubble has said is that um, libraries, the ones that, you know, sign your work forever and take your publishing and it's like a, it's not a sync agency. I've heard her say that is like, you know, sign with a sync agency where they're going to take all in and or directly pitch your stuff. But um, I think it just depends on the music you're making. Yeah. If you're going direct to an to a supervisor, you have to know what they're working on and do you have that's a fit. Don't just, you know, try to always send them stuff that's not going to fit what they need when they're extremely busy trying that to solve no the puzzle. That makes no sense at all. That just doesn't make any sense at all. What? What piece? Directing, going direct to a music supervisor and saying, hey, you need this song this week. That's, I, And I think a lot of people just think, oh, well, they could need it. And and of course. Yeah, that's, I hope they need it. But that's ridiculous because. Right. But you know, they're super busy. Yeah. And, and, and it could be the most abstract thing they're looking for. So it, that's a needle in a needle stack approach to me is going direct to a music yeah. supervisor unless you like have a personal relationship and you see them and you're having coffee and you're going oh i'm working on this song by the way you don't need any country today do you because i have a great country song that could be yeah. a thing where they go oh you know but next week i have a thing and that's a you know that's i i get that and i want that yeah. relationship with people or an email list maybe um, of of yeah. people to say, okay, I've just released this country album. It's got real players and everything from Nashville and stuff. It's the real deal, and it's it's all about this kind of stuff. And it f- sounds like these kind of thing. If any of my friends out there who you know are on this email list are, are have a need for that kind of thing, you might want to check it out. And sometimes those friends are libraries, and they say, "Ooh, I like that. Can, let me show it to me the whole thing." And then they will, may want to sign it, 
or it could be a music supervisor or sync agent says, I happen to need that. Somebody just asked me for that. You think that's a good yeah. solution? Do you, I, I imagine you do that kind of thing. I would say we are big advocates of signing with a sync agency. A sync, if you're an artist or a songwriter who's making songs that have top lines, sync agencies are the ones, and not libraries, sync agencies that sign, you know, songs with lyrics that are create taking the time to create those relationships that can pitch your music to more than one opportunity to more than one supervisor for their one specific thing um, we I, I'm a huge advocate for having your song signed and a library in my mind is more of a this is where we go when we need a lot of music that we can license for a certain fee we know we can clear it and it's uh, and if you're making instrumentals a lot of instrumentals that's a, I think it's a great place to put your music. It's a great place to have your music represented, depending on what you're creating. And you can have music that has top line in there too. I mean, there's certainly a place for that if you're just making a ton of music all the time. Like, why not um, spread it out? Explain top you know, line like you're doing. Um, from your perspective, just in case somebody doesn't know what that top, means. Top line is the, the melody and the lyrics on top of an instrumental track, you know, so you are you could be the producer and you're like, I, re I made this track, it's instrumental, and then somebody can top line that, which means they put a melody and lyrics to it. Which is big in the beats world, you know, where you go, you know, the, I think in hip hop, this is a very normal thing. You go find a beat that you like on beat stars or someplace else, and then you put a top line on it and then you go and, and, and release that song and all that kind of stuff. But I think in almost every other genre, that's not a thing other than people who do licensing and pop. And I don't know if, if, if any other genre really uses, you know, the word top line or beats. <laughs> those two those two words are very used by someone like you who who does this kind of thing but i think for most musicians the thought of finding someone else's music to put words and melody to is a, like a, a revelation and or just making beats for people who who are who have the the artist side or you know rappers i consider top line for definitely for pop music i mean you know it's you, you don't have to necessarily separate them like you can write the song and the top line is just those pieces of it so yeah. you might be the person who's doing the production the top line the the vocals all of it or maybe there's different people on your team that are each doing responsible for different pieces of it uh, when i'm creating a project i can start from scratch and just me on the piano writing the chords and lyrics and whatever, and then take it and find a producer for it. Or I can work with the producer and say, these are the types of songs I want to create. Can you create, um, you know, a track and I'll, I'll do the top line for it. Yeah. They'll send me a track and then I'll write a top line. Yeah. So I think there's lots of ways it can look. Uh, I, I think there's uh, not enough information out there about the fact that there's two different, I literally have two kinds of different companies that I call one positive spin songs and guess what all positive spin songs are basically mm -hmm. vocal songs they have vocals with lyrics mm -hmm. and then i have master yeah. score music which is for cues and for instrumentals and for every other thing the orchestral so all that cool. kind of stuff so there's two two i think of them separately you know i have a line kind of between yeah. which one goes to which quote unquote company and that's how i decide yeah. to pitch the master score music the orchestral and cues and stuff that works much better in libraries than it's going to work ever try to pitch it to somebody you know oh listen to my drum line music you know although you know sometimes people would need that but um uh, yeah i think libraries are going to err on that side more than then a music supervisor is going to go, oh, I'm so glad you called me with your drumline thing today. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they would. I, you know, well, I, you, you know, if you are looking for a drumline, I'm your person. I, well, that you and, <laughs> yeah, if you're looking for positive, even, you know, I also kind of on, you got to have things, I think, that you do that not everybody does. And so I do a lot of classical, I do a lot of jazz, I do a lot of other genres, Christian and gospel and sacred, you know, that's kind of one of our things. Super cool. And that's those awesome. are things that not everybody offers. So you need to have those things. If you do reggae and that's all you do, people are gonna need reggae at some point and they need to know who you are. Mm -hmm. um, I also do reggae. Um, anyway, so. Um, I like it. Let's. Uh, yeah, you're so versatile. Well, it's, it also shoots you in the foot because no one wants to hear that you're versatile. 
you know. Well, who, but you can say you're versatile once you're in a conversation. You know who wants to know you're versatile is your library uh, because they can come to you for a lot of things. And you don't just do yeah. hip hop all day long. And not that there's anything wrong with hip hop. I just don't necessarily do it. And um, it's just not my thing. I know I probably look like somebody who probably does a lot of hip hop, you know, just you know, just from my personality. But, the, kiss, um, the kiss shirt gave it away. <laughs> I knew it. I shouldn't have worn the kiss shirt. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, also, as you're a person pitching stuff out to people as a sync agent, a secret agent, secret sync agent. Um, I'm a secret, secret agent. A secret witch, secret sync agent. Yes. Um, Obviously not so secret. I left my hat out. <laughs> we discovered your secret. Oh, this this is, video is going a different way. Oh, it's so, gonna be viral. <laughs> um, <laughs> conferences and networking. I want to talk about next. Um, I just did a virtual um, v- visit to the PMC conference, which was very fun and actually oh. very good online conference. I know it's live as well, but the the online part was done very well. And it was also great because I could sit here and work on tunes and listen at the same time and network at the same time. So if you are, although I I hope to get out to L.A. next year and be part of some of those, including the get signed uh, things. That's online. Oh, it's online? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. But um, I think this is a bigger deal than a lot of people think. Whether you think you're going to be pitching the libraries or pitching direct, I still think it's important that you go to places and network. And do you still do that kind of stuff? Is that still part of your thing? Or have you done enough? Yeah, You're done. just last. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I, I just, uh, well, just last week went to uh, the AICP Awards, which is for advertising. So you're meeting people in advertising, you know, mm-hmm. that are creating commercials. And that's a um, really interesting space to be in. I think in terms of, you know, part of it is just meeting like-minded people and realizing and remembering that you're not alone on the journey of being a creative and finding ways to create with other people, not just in music, but, you know, these these other people that are in music, not on the creation side, they're in music because they love music. So how can you guys be in partnership yeah. together? And just finding, like, those teams and finding people that you click with. and. Yeah being a part of the industry that is your industry. And when you go to these events, I feel like you really are able to take your seat at the table a little bit more because you realize you're a part of something like a community and it's not just you against the world trying to sort yourself out and and share your music. And for me, I feel like that's, uh, I didn't always feel that way. I would go to these events and, and hope, you know, like, I'd find the answer, like the person who's gonna love my song or is gonna know how to like, what to do with what I'm doing. And what I've really come to to enjoy about them is just finding your space and taking your seat at the table and having real conversations with people about cool projects that you yeah. can do together. It's one of the joys actually of doing a podcast or, or um, yeah. on YouTube is yeah. that you get to have these conversations with people that, you know, you, you get to see them. I mean, even though you're not necessarily at in the same room, you still get to laugh and talk and 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 share stuff, you know. And that's that's kind of fun. Yeah. And I did that at the first of my last career when I was trying to build up my production business. I would go to conferences and I would set up a table and I would put my CDs out or what tapes or and literature or whatever. And and I would volunteer a lot of times at conferences and I mm. would like mm. meet the people that became friends in the industry for 20 years they're still friends in the industry mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. you know label heads and and lawyers and uh, just uh, music publishing people and also and they all just became people I could visit with every time I went to Nashville or any time I was in Nashville or whatever and still are you know and I think that's because I know they're about their families you know, I know about about more than just the music part of their life. I know about them, yeah. the, all the players. The thing I miss most about being in Nashville all the time and doing the, I mean, I just still do a ton of tracking up there, but I just watch it online or I just have them do it in their homes or whatever. But I miss going to lunch 
You know, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. was the best part of the day. At 11 o'clock, everybody's already asking, where are we going for lunch today? Nashville, probably like L.A., yeah. is a very lovely place to go eat. There are lots of great places to eat. Yeah. But yeah. more than that, you get to hang out with four or five top musicians and hear their stories. And it is just – or engineers, you know, who are – Tomorrow they're touring with Garth Brooks or Michael McDonald or whoever, you know, and you're hearing these stories, but at the same time, and you also know them. I've known these guys for 20 plus years that I use for playing and, and mixing and stuff. And so you, I think that's the kind of thing you get when you go to these conferences and you start to meet people and, and they become friends uh, more as much as they become like network networking and the licensing business type of thing, you know, which is cool. I also have one friend, uh, Marcus, who has revealed to me his LinkedIn strategy, which I think is very smart. Whenever he goes to a conference, he comes home and just links in and everybody. And I think LinkedIn is starting to become a a place to do business for us, even better than almost anything else. I don't know. Do you use LinkedIn at all with some of your? I do. I mean, on the business side, it's really helpful to connect to who's doing what on which agency and how do you kind of like figure out where they are and what they're doing and what they've worked on recently. And it's, it's certainly helpful. I mean, how I would, would imagine we otherwise no. With supervisors, it's really important because they seem like they're on different shows all the time and working for different mm-hmm. companies all the time. And that seems, mm-hmm. I don't know, music supervisor, music supervision, I was going to say music supervisory, music supervision seems very like it's, there's a lot of turnover. Is that, mm-hmm. do you see that or is that? I mean, I think they work on projects here. A lot of the times, a, a lot of them are not in-house, you know, they work yeah. project to project. So gotcha. they're not just like the music supervisor, no matter what the network brings in, they're brought in per project. So they're, uh, music supervisors work hard. I mean, their job mm-hmm. is not guaranteed and they are not like, in-house with benefits depending on the job obviously you know but there are some there are some that are like the in-house music supervisor for this but there are some that aren't and they really hustle and work hard to become the name that you want to have on a project um, and be associated with certain types of projects and I mean I'm not a music supervisor but from what I've heard and what I see and you know understand they, they work really hard to make a name and to have a space, take up space. Yeah. What role do you think disco now has, disco.ac has in staying abreast of, uh, or staying in touch with people and showing people uh, what's up and all that kind of stuff? Do you use disco and do you, it seems like it's become kind of the industry standard place. I did an interview with them recently. Disco is the saving grace. (laughs) I just love disco. We we used disco at Catch the Moon when it first came on. Um, wow! Like first started, and because we were using Box before, and I, I was like, "Oh my that. gosh!" Now you can like see who listened to your music. You can like put the metadata in, like not try to put it in and then upload it to Box and hope that it's showing. And you know, not so. It's just you know, it's beyond in the fact that it's universal if other people are using it they can add your songs to their library without downloading it and uploading it and ah uh, they just they just keep they just keep out doing themselves i can't say enough great things about disco same i love them although you just brought up a little i'm i think i'm still a little salty about the whole box versus dropbox controversy with catch the moon um, oh yeah well i just remember i, I was a dropbox one. guy and and they and they catch the moon always wanted box and I was like, but Dropbox works this. No, Box. It's got to be Box. And and it wasn't just Catch the Moon. There was probably other people. But uh, let's not go there because I, get, <laughs> I don't want to get into yeah, that whole thing. I don't thing. remember get that it. part. <laughs> I'll I'm put just, a witch's spell on you. <laughs> but you need to, so I just don't think about yeah. that. Um, yeah. All right. Let's, let's go on to briefs versus write what you want to write. And... I, this is another one of those things that I have con- continuing conversations about that some people say, you've got to write for the brief. And and then, I, and then I say, there's no way I can live like that anymore because that's what I did for clients for 20 years. I produced what they wanted, exactly the way they wanted. And then I meet people who make you know multiple six figures. They say, dude, I write briefs every day. 
and that's all I do, and that's how I make 80% of my income. <sighs> and I just can't. I, you know, I have to write what I really want, I'm really excited about. And I, I think probably you do too. You come, probably come from writing what you want and then pitching it versus writing the brief, but maybe I, maybe you do. I don't know. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think both, if you can combine the two, I think it really sucks when you end up with this song and you're like, well, where is this going to go? What's it going to do? I was hoping this would work for sync. And you know, I, th- I look back at some of the music that I've written before I knew about licensing. And I'm like, hmm, well, if I changed that line, it would be... You know, it wouldn't take away from the integrity of the song and how I wanted to express this, but it would make it a lot easier to license. Mm-hmm. And so I think that there are some things where you're not giving up the integrity of the song, but you're considering like, could this be used in something? Like, what would it be used for? Would this be helpful for telling somebody's visual story? Um, or am I kind of... Uh, and so, I don't know, I think both are true. I tend to... Uh, listen to or or take in I see briefs and I think oh that's interesting I keep seeing that kind of a sound I keep seeing that kind of sound let me make a playlist of that kind of sound let me see who might want to make a song like that or a couple songs like that because this is a fun I really like I really like that sound like let's let's see what we can create I see stuff where I'm like no I don't want to create anything like that that doesn't sound like my thing I'm not going to go and create that just because that's being asked for and then sometimes I'm like I just need to figure out how I'm feeling right now and I just need to sit down at the piano and I just need to let out whatever comes out and I don't want to think about is this going to work for somebody's thing and I just need to write and that I have found used to be the way that I only wrote and now I'm trying to bring it back in a little bit more because it's really the roots of of why I do what I do you know the processing of what you're feeling through your emotion through your song writing um, but I think that there is definitely truth to being able to f- do all of it in one. Because no song I've written is without truth to me, yeah. my truth. I, I think where I am now is I try, I, I've always been an album creator. Ever since I started, even when I started writing songs, I thought, oh, I could make an album of these kind of songs. Or I could make an album. And I would daydream about my album. You know, I would say, oh, I'm going to write this That's song cool. and this song and this song. And I would just write it down. And I'd be, even when I worked a regular job, I would write down. And I would make album covers of the, what this album was going to be and everything. Of course, I never finished it. I never really finished things. I still started working for clients. And then I had to finish a 10-song album because they were paying me to. And and so I got good at finishing albums. And so now when I write for Sync, I write an album. I'm going to make an album of marching band music that sounds like that a football game. Or I'm going to make an album yeah, cool. of, oh, what did I just sign? Uh, Halloween music that's actually Christmas music. It's Christmas, it's Christmas songs that I've changed the key from major to minor and turned into Halloween songs. And that's I just cool. got that signed in. You know, uh, and they, they – t- my guy told me at BMG, he goes, they love it. They they featured it because they, it's so different and weird. And I think you got to be different and weird a little bit. I, I do understand yeah. briefs. And I think there are different kinds of briefs. I think there are the kinds of briefs that every that a billion people get that you, you see. I get three emails. It's for the same song from three different companies that are sending me brief yeah. emails, you know. And those are just like general briefs going out. And, and they want it in two hours. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine, and she said, that I call those I- interrupters. <laughs> they just interrupt my day because I get this email, mm-hmm. and I'm like, ah, and I have to stop what I'm doing because I um, – but I think if I get a brief from a library that says, I need five songs, and here's the exact what they want, then – and I know that's only going to 50 or to 100 people, then I'm going to jump on that probably and make that yeah. because I, I know awesome. that library is already getting me – placements and so i want to that kind of brief makes more sense because i i yeah. know that it's got a chance versus yeah. you know the so you're saying there's a chance uh, i can't play that game anymore you know um yeah oh yeah i understand what you're saying so like to custom things yeah. um also yeah and our, i mean in our community we we give you six briefs a month you get to choose one to write to and at the end of the month the top songs are selected for a playlist and I pitch it out to agencies and most of the sampler gets signed. Um, but those briefs are coming from 
agencies this is like hey this is we could use more of this in our catalog or cool. we're seeing a lot of this trend and and if you're writing one of those a month in a year you have a catalog of music that is geared towards what agencies are looking for what mm -hmm. people want to sign and you're not in a bad position to have you know there's a lot of flexibility in how creative you want to be and the creativity you bring to the table but 12 songs you know that's pretty that's, well if you're if you're going at a pace that's a good one i sometimes forget that most many people starting this write one song a month or you know a few songs a year they don't write 100 or 500 <laughs> because of they have yeah. so many clients or things to do or people. Mm -hmm. And for those people, they need that kind of structure. Somebody needs to give them some kind of structure or they will just la 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 all day long and not really ever come up with anything. One of the main things I, I tend to do when I work for clients is give them structure because they've never had it before. They've just kind of created kind of blindly. And so I can see. I can see that too. Oh, I, want, I know what I wanted to say. Regarding briefs and write what you want to write. I just think of stuff. Um, <laughs> regarding briefs and what you want to write. I got ready this year for Christmas. Every Christmas, I'm always getting the same brief. You probably get this too. Do you have anything that sounds like Mariah Carey vocals, female vocals? And so the past month has been about writing and or co-writing with my my people uh, about of of songs that sound like that any or anything that's like fun vocal Christmas because you know, I have tons of like instrumental Christmas and, but that's really more for library nobody's like sending a brief saying if you only had you know a classical arrangement of this song this Christmas song but they are saying do you have Mariah Carey or do you have Bing Crosby or do you have this or that and so I find that uh, that's that's something I've really been trying to write this year is uh, uh, getting ready for briefs. You know, I, I have started doing more covers lately, you know, to get ready for the covers that I see asked for all the time. Because the covers, yeah. there's there's only one library I have, and that's crucial, who will that just take um, covers. And they just started doing that. And uh, otherwise, I don't know if my libraries are that interested in chasing down all that stuff for covers, you know, or if supervisors are. Now, so I know sometimes supervisors are looking for sound alikes or for actual covers, but um, that's something that's interesting to me and that I'm trying to do, like you talked about, writing for what could be used versus, you know, necessarily. But I pick songs that I want to do, and I do them in some weird way that no one else would do, you know. So... Um, We've talked about that you pitch like a sync agent, so I don't think I have to do that. But I do have a question. How, how do you pitch when you are pitching? Do you pitch to all of your network with an email list? Do you pitch individually, both? Um, what's, your, what's your method? What's your secrets, Witchy Poo? <laughs> you don't even know who Witchy Poo is. Witchy Poo was in a show that when I was growing up was on Saturday mornings. And it was, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Somebody watching this video will know who Witchy Poo was. But she was like, <laughs> it was like this witch <laughs> wow. that these, uh, they were on this island. I can't remember. There was a magic flute. I can't remember a talking flute, actually. Um, H.R. Puffin Stuff was the name of this show. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, I, I a, feel like I've heard H.R. Puffin Stuff. Yeah, it was, an, it was a 70s weird, one of those weird 70s show. But um, anyway. So, how do you pitch? What's your method? What's your well, secrets? I, like right now, I'm not. I mean, I'm not really actively pitching. Uh, like I was for Catch the Moon, where it was like television ads across the board. You know, we had a really robust. Right now, I'm really focused on ads and trailers yeah. and very specific um, music and composer that I represent I really represent like one composer and and the artists that fall under his company so it's a little bit different but I would say I you know the other thing that I'm pitching actually is our sampler every month so I do pitch our sampler yeah, every month that's kind of what I'm talking about signed um I pitch individually okay. I send out an individual email um I do newsletters but I feel like a newsletter you don't have to respond to because that person didn't take the time to write you 
But when I take the time to write somebody, they usually take the time to write back because you are writing them. Yeah. And a newsletter is just like, okay, cool. Well, when I get the chance, you know, which is fine, which is sometimes I think, you know, I, I have friends that are supervisors who they look forward to having the newsletter because that's how they stay atop, on top of what you're doing. They download it. They put it in there. You know, cattle, it, it's fine. Like there's nothing wrong with the newsletter. But if I'm wanting a personal, hey, I thought of you, this is curated just for you like sort of thing i i like the personal touch i'm starting to find that i am including my disco catalog a lot of times to people and saying listen i'm, yeah. I'm i have this new album but you could search the catalog for anything really if you're looking yeah that's really cool are you so advanced that you're hooked into other people's disco or are you searching disco for songs ever or do you ever do that or do you know if music supervisors are doing that I, supposedly disco tells us that music supervisors are using disco yeah, to that, search I, I don't know i don't have the intel on that yeah i'd love to get some intel if if music supervisors are using disco like they do would use a bmg library or probably. something like that i mean you know? probably sometimes yeah. i would imagine but i don't know i'm not i don't haven't asked people that question okay well get on that um it's a good question <laughs> yeah i'll, I'll get back to you <laughs> okay our reporter from the field will get back to us at some point. All right, last thing. Um, AI, the elephant in the room, and licensing. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, – I've, I've literally had people email me and say, I've got a whole album I made with AI. How can I get that to sync? I'm like, dude, don't. Just don't. Do you use any AI programs, uh, music or otherwise, in what you do? Because I do. Um. I use AI for artwork. I've mm -hmm. been playing around with that for um, writing copy for emails sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just for lyric ideas. Yeah. You know, not super impressed, but sometimes they'll just throw something out where you're like, oh, that's a cool concept. That's a cool idea. But that's the extent. I'm not really using it for any music creation right Are now. You a do what doll things. do you use? Are you a doll user? A, a digital audio workstation uh, user? I am, like, I can use Logic or um, I really am usually in something called Studio 5, which is so simple and easy, but either either of those two. Yeah, I am, I am, pro, I am Team Logic and have been since before it was even owned by Apple. And mm -hmm. um, it has Stem Splitter on it now, and I find myself using it all the time. Um, oh, yeah, uh, that makes sense, right? Only because I'm using it to reference. And so what I'll do is, like, this one guy said, literally, I was like, do you have a song? And it's, uh, it's I'm trying to figure it out. And I said, do you have a song that I can use? And he says, yes, Thriller by Michael Jackson. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. Um, but literally what I did was I went to the video, I downloaded it, uh, the audio of it, and I stem split it and I use just the beat to put him into the beat of Thriller and then of course I'm not going to use that beat but I'm going to redo you know a, a beat and make a new production on top of that I'm not using wow. not using the vocal not using the bass not using the the stuff and it's only so usable anyway but the drums are helpful to find the tempo that they like and then also the the where they want to hear the beat on one and two and three and four, you know, and, and the syncopation and stuff that they're looking for. So I use AI a lot now for stem split. I didn't think I would, but it's really, I used it for another guy who did a Christmas song and he did it off this one song. And I used that song to get exactly what he sang to. I could hear his click wow. and his click. And so Logic has ways you can click, you know, get them all together and all that kind of stuff. So that's very wow. interesting. I'm also musically using a program called Automy, which is a vocal replacer, and you basically, I can sing a song, because I can sing, and I sing a song, and then I put it up there, and I'll find some country guy's voice or some airy female voice that, I, if I want it to be the same, sometimes I'll do kind of a, a guy and girl, um, a wonder type of thing where I'll sing the male part, and then we'll do a, a girl and guy, like... Um, singing the same note, uh, unison type of thing, and it works really great for that. Or I just use it and use a voice for the for the demo, so I can. Uh, but I could use it for background yeah. vocals. I haven't even just started using that. But that kind of tech is so helpful, and it's somewhat ethical because the people who gave their voices are getting paid just like they, in, they're licensed, right. you know. And so just right. like That's we cool. get licensing, they're getting licensing for their singing. 
Um, I also do it for art. I use something called Leonardo.ai, and it is so fun to use. Um, oh, wow. For art. That's cool. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, it's fun. It's really good. Leonardo.ai. Yeah. And then I use this cool. thing called Disco, which has AI oh, in it now. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And yeah. Uh, it's, it's doing my tagging for me. Half the tagging is done um, a lot of times. I still have to fix it up, but it's pretty cool that they do the tagging, the auto tagging. Yeah. It's amazing. Sonic, thank you so much for for just being available and sharing all your stuff. Of course, I'm going to put all your information down below, and you can tell me exactly what you want me to put down there for people to click on and come to. You have so many resources. Your website alone is just a huge resource, and I love what you guys offer. We've done to Catch the Moon, and then we've done from Catch the Moon to here. What's from here on out for you? What's the future? Do you know? I mean, just same? Mm. or. What's the future? Well, hold on. Let me get my cauldron <laughs> and my... <laughs> Stir <Hold> around. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, there's more. I have an EP that I created that is really dear to my heart that I'm in the middle of releasing. And I took cool. a little time um, since the last release to kind of just promote the ones I had out and figure out what I, you know, promotion for the next couple. So that coming up in 2025 um i'm working with some new teams on some fun music that's a little outside the box it's positive but feels authentic mm -hmm. um authentic to me and um yeah just i'm working on a few a few things around vocals right now for for some projects but i'll talk about that some other time how much is your how much of your life is is music making versus um, networking slash marketing? Mm, well, that's the I'm that's the balance. I don't know. Sometimes I go through phases where it's really heavy in the music making. Um, right now is not one of those phases, and I'm trying to. I I just want to remember to keep creating yeah. and having specific projects I'm creating for or a project with a team really helps me stay in the okay well we're getting this song done these are the days we meet this is what it's for there's a goal in mind um, otherwise it's really easy for me to stay in the networking and the business of it and running a, a community and running after toddlers so I the, the making of the music is why I do what I do yeah. you know and so I can't I can't forget that piece of the puzzle well, I am, uh, after a few years of teaching and really investing, especially on the channel, and I'm not even sure what the future of the channel is, with continued libraries and needs and, and as I get more people wanting to pay me for music of my own that I am making for that, for me as a producer for other people, and still even this video is for other people, I've been very heavily invested in teaching and producing and leading artists and and people and helping and I that's fine I love doing that you you love doing that that's part, it's kind of like it's just built into who we are probably but at the same time you know I've probably written a thousand songs in my life I think I could write a thousand more in the next five years just because of what's happening now as far as how many libraries to serve and and the way things are coming and I I'm kind of like especially in the past month or two since I left that teaching job I'm sitting here every day creating and even if, even if it's not mine, I'm kind of co-creating with other uh, collabing and stuff. And that's just my heart. And to the point where I do one hour of YouTube a week. This, is, this week's weird because I have two interviews, but usually I do one live on Fridays now. That's it. That's, uh, maybe I might generate some AI shorts that go out, not that they do anything. But, you know, I, I, do, I love doing the thing, but not as much as I love doing spiccato violas and uh and writing songs and so i'm kind of like m moving back to my creative self uh more I hear you. and uh and and i love teaching i love sharing information but there's also like you said there's seasons and i think my season is getting back now to to the music and i think that's important because i think that should be the plan for anyone who's really, if you're interested in licensing or, or getting your music out and doing things, you've got to be making the music. And I think a lot of people get so caught up in the how and the why in some of these things that we're doing, they forget to really write really and work on great 
music. And I yeah. kind of have that built in, not because I'm super talented, but because I know great people and they, they make great recordings for me. When you know great musicians, it makes you look like a genius. That's how I was a producer for 20 years <laughs> because I, I looked like I was a genius, but I was really just, you know, hiring the right people. But now it's I'm kind of back to doing both my own stuff and using other people because you got to do it yourself because no one else is going to do it for you. You got to do it. Yeah. And I mean, that's it. So. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I think it takes some, there's always seasons, but I certainly feel that too. Finding that balance of creating and making sure you're staying in the industry, making the music and also knowing the people. Like both of those are important pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. And I'm for also me. in a different time in my life than you are because my toddler is 30. One, you know, and uh, yeah. I, I am, uh, my wife is basically retired and I'm six years away from, I mean, I, you don't retire from what I do. You don't retire from writing songs and, and producing songs yeah. and playing all day long. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, I, I have a lot more time to devote to it. And there are a lot of people probably listening to this that are in their later part of their life where they're either think about retire, you know, I don't call it retirement, I call it refocusment. You know, you're refocusing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where you want to, how you want to make money and, and how you want to invest. And I look at licensing as investing. And I tell people this all the time. Yeah, it's it's great. very much like investing. You got to think of it that way rather than, you know, can this make me a, an income for, you know, like at my job? Well, maybe in 10 years, you uh, if you really work hard. I mean, the people I know that have made it an income, first of all, weren't doctors or lawyers to begin with because they, they're not going to do it that way. I do have clients who are doctors and lawyers and they they just kind of do this for fun, you know, because they're never yeah, going to yeah. make that money doing this. But yeah. there is a time and can be a time where you can um, make money. It's just it just takes it's investing and it's investing for a long time because the people I know who make six figures are they have 3000 songs out there, you know, in libraries yeah. or they're busting it, you know, getting uh, $20,000 sinks and stuff like that. But they are busting it. And most of us don't bust it. Busting it. You know, yeah. so well. Thank you for your time. Well, this has been so awesome. <laughs> I really loved hearing you, like what you're up to, what you've been working on, what you're putting out into the world, the incredible amount of music that you're making, and your perspective on music making, and just getting to sit in your energy. Thanks for having <laughs> me on the show. I really, really loved being here. Well, you were a part of the beginning of that. Um, I don't even know if you know how giving you were at that time as part of Catch the Moon and so many people who were part of that just had your energy. Because Kathy ran out of time to get back to everybody and you got back to everybody. And you were like just so encouraging. And I mean, not that I needed encouragement for my cr professional career because I was already making a, a full-time living as a music producer. So I didn't need that from that. But f in licensing, I think, uh, I bet, there are a lot of people who, who were and still are probably your clients now that are that are part of Two Indy are just so blessed by your spirit all the time with them or your spirits oh. or your spells or whatever it is that you're doing, <laughs> <laughs> whatever well, magic that you have. So I think we've uh, got to the end of that. I know. It's so funny. I just, I, you know, it's Halloween and next weekend there's, you don't even think about like, oh, that's so strange. Why is there a witch's hat in her bed? <laughs> Because someone asked me, are you doing a halloween -ish episode? I'm like, of what? Why would I do that? Because um, I have another one about cassettes because I've been mining cassettes this week. Ooh, from cool. a, Somebody gave me oh, a cassette God. player and I've been trying to find old things and realizing how bad technology was in the 80s and 90s. All right. Well, have okay. a great day. Thanks so much. We'll talk you to too. you next have time. You too. Have a great day.